a neophyte writer, never produced anything, not anything at all as a writer, walks over to me and says, Danny, I want you to be in my play. And I said, I'm not an actor. He said, yes, you are. You just don't know it. Now, may he rest in peace. Louis the Rooster II from Hoboken, New Jersey, wrote me a play called Lamppost Reunion for an off, 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 off <laughs> Broadway. I did the play in the Churchyard Playhouse on West 53rd Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. It was just, it, it was not actually put on. It was a workshop situation trying to develop the place. People came in and saw it. They put money into it, and it ended up on Broadway with me starring in it. Then he had written me a play called Knockout. We went off, 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 <laughs> off. We got money. We put that on Broadway. It lasted a year on Broadway. The first one, Lampos Reunion, was a hit also. Then he writes me another one, Wheelbarrow Close is where I play the world's greatest Southern Bible salesman. Off, 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 off. <laughs> and it went to Broadway. We got the money. It's the first time that I know, to my knowledge, that anyone has been lucky enough to have three off, off, off <laughs> that ended up on Broadway. So my career began in that way, and it was mainly because of Bud Friedman, of course, allowing me to be in his place to learn the craft to, to a certain extent. And for Louis LaRusso II, anything I am today, good or bad, whatever you may think, you can blame it on Louis LaRusso, not me. And my life goes on as I continue to work. I have a, a movie coming out called Reach Me, uh, which will be out uh, in November. And uh, I'm singing all over the place. Maybe not well, but I interpret songs well, you know, as an actor. And I have uh, my fifth album just came out September 17th. So if there are any questions that you may wish to ask me, if any of you people read the memoirs, I promise you, if it doesn't sell one copy, I have written the book I wanted to write. How the title came about, Simon and Schuster didn't want it, it was too long. Now, I didn't know whether you need a long title, a short title. Here's how I came up with the title. J.J. Gray, a great blues singer from way down south, recorded a song called, I don't know who I am when I am somebody else. My wife heard it in the house and she said, my God, that's you. I said, what do you mean that's you? You don't know who the hell you are. <laughs> that's how the title came about. She said that and I put it in. Now, Jennifer Bergstrom championed the book for me. She's the vice president at Simon & Schuster. I love her dearly. And uh, she said to me, first of all, they, are, they didn't argue with me. They indicated to me that we can't have something so long. I said, look, I don't, want it. I don't want the title to hit it on the head, what the book is about. I want it to be a little convoluted. I want it to be complicated. I want people to look at the title and say, what the hell is this? And maybe require them a little bit to look, to, to, to ask questions about it, which they usually do. And I give them that answer and they love it. And she looked at me at lunch one day and she said, you got the title. Mm -hmm. And I felt great. And the title of the book is, I only know who I am when I am somebody else. My life on the street, on the stage, and in the movies. If you have any questions about any part of it, please ask me. Coke, diet Coke. <laughs> I don't drink, no drugs, drink. <laughs> I'm an old 87 year old retired history professor, South Italian. Now, you will always be, I've seen you a lot, but you're always going to be Johnny Hamilton. <laughs> I watch that movie so often that my kids don't want to get the tissue back. I say, all right, he's ready to cry. This always comes at the end, ready to So, that is my all-time favorite movie, and I thought, I just thought you were superb in that. Well, I want to thank you. You know, I want to say that. I don't want to disappoint you. I hated my character. In my neighborhood, when you play a wimp, you get smacked. You understand? I was a major wimp in that movie. 
Oh, uh, excuse me, Mother. You think Nikki Cage is going to get a girl over me? <laughs> Not going to happen. You were I could hit harder. I'm sorry. You were absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. I love the part, especially when you're with your mother in Italy. I, I could relate to all this. This was Italian fan, and John Chandley. The, the He's writer. great. He's an Irishman. How he did this? Can I say this to you, just to show you how something so so joyous to be turned around in a moment and really adversely affect you? I was talking about, I can't marry you, Loretto, or my mother will die, okay? That became the catchphrase. Every time I was out in the street, someone would eventually come over and say, I can't marry you, Loretta, my mother will die. <laughs> Here's the sadness. The sadness is that my mother was dying. Now, it wasn't the fault of anyone who was saying that. Certainly, it wasn't communicated to people that my mother, Frances, was dying. You know, so it, it really, for that moment, I tried to rise above it, but inwardly it was killing me every time it was said. I just want you to know that. I got two questions on this. Yeah. First, well, this act, first, did you, all, did you all get along together, all the actors? In this? Well, we did. Uh, so it was, uh, Nicky didn't. Nicky is a, he's a wonderful actor, and I love him. He was like a son. He looks like my son, Jamie, so much. They look like twins. I took this kid under my arm and loved him immediately, but he took some harassing on so I'm not going to say from who, but there were some difficult times because Nikki is a perfectionist. And you know, and sometimes when you're a perfectionist, people don't understand it. He was developing things that people didn't understand his way of working. With the exception of one person, Cher, who loved him dearly. And Cher was the reason he got the role. The first two people hired for that movie happened to be Cher and Danny Aiello. The rest came later. And uh, she decided, she went over to Norman Jewison, who was a great director, and said to Norman, I want him in or I'm out. So that's why Nikki got the job. But everyone else got along, except for one passing wind incident, because someone when we were rehearsing was passing wind. We didn't know who the hell it was. <laughs> we all thought it was Gossie, you know, this wonderful man who played the uncle. And because he was the oldest guy and looked like a guy who might pass wind as, as, as often as he wanted to. And we found out it was one of the women. I'm not going to tell you who it is. All I can tell you, she was a vegetarian and she farted like crazy. And all of us got wind of it, let me tell you. I'm going to say who it is. We have the sons, the seeds in the Atlanta, Olivia Dukakis. Yes, she's great. Your friend's the husband. Yes. And then she, have I been a good wife? Yes. And yeah, yeah, and then it stops. And you know, your heart just breaks. Yeah, stop. Singing she wasn't a bad Italian for a Greek. She wasn't a bad Italian for a Greek. You know, I'm talking about Olympia. Yeah. But no, it was great. There was some of the things. I mean, some of the th there's such quotable lines. And Vincent Gardenia, oh, yeah. may of course he rest in peace, was like a mentor. Could I say something about Vincent? Yeah. I'm doing Bang the Drum Slowly, my first movie. It's a baseball movie, okay? I had about eight lines in the movie. I played first base. My character was Horse Bird. I'm sitting in the corner mumbling to myself lines that I anticipate saying on the screen. I'm concerned. I'm a new actor. First time I'm doing the show. I worked the stage. First film. This is heavy. How am I going to say this line? How am I going to... I'm saying it to myself, mumbling. Vincent Gardini walks over and says, what's the matter, kid? I said, well, Mr. Gardini, I'll tell you. You know, I have these eight lines and I'm kind of concerned. You know, I'm apprehensive about it how to say them because I know, I know if I say them wrong and I see the movie 50 times, I'm going to stink 50 times. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, don't worry, kid, you're probably never going to work again anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Vincent said, may you rest, I love them. Go ahead, one more because I got other people. Okay, all right. well, who taught you all the, 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 the uh, New York accent? I'm a, I'm a born New Yorker. I know, but Cher wasn't. No, Cher was they, uh the woman that you first mentioned. She was the consultant on Old Voice. She worked with the Brooklyn accent with everyone in the cast. Uh, not Olympia Dukakis. God, I'm forgetting the name. What the hell is the matter with me? The first name you mentioned, she played the aunt. The aunt. The, the aunt in the movie. The aunt, aunt. You, you, you mentioned her name. Ah, don't worry about it. It's all right. She, she, but she was. I, how could I forget her name? I feel terrible. I, 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 please give me that for a minute. Shandy said he didn't want anything changed in the script at all. But one change was made. You know what it was? No. I always thought it was Olympia at the restaurant, and mm -hmm. she's having this thing with you know what I learned on Skippery Week. I don't know. But, uh, I think instead it was when she said to uh, share. 
What are you doing? Your life's going down the toilet. All right. I thought that. But the last thing is, Johnny, why do men need other women? Well, she figured it was because they're afraid of death. Right. And when you answered And of course, that, that's a true statement. Right. Yes. When you answered that. I said something about my rib. Right. Sure. Then you <laughs> forgive me, forgive me for not remembering all the lines, but I can <laughs> recite, I can recite bus schedules forever. <laughs> but I didn't particularly like that movie. That's why I don't remember all the lines. You probably have them all. Any it's other so questions? Hi, okay. right, Danny. I first saw you in Gemini on Broadway. Wow. Foul mouth, but wonderful. Did you do that full run? No, uh, you know, I left it. Almost 2,000 performances. You want to know something? Here's a strange thing. I, I never realized I was such an opinionated guy until I read this book. I said, God, how could anyone tolerate me? I said, I was so opinionated. When I first did Gemini, it was a big hit. You know, on, um, Peter Mark Schiff, the director, Albert Enorado, of course, was the author. And, uh, the thing about that play was, oh, what was the point I wanted to make? He got me here with Moonstruck. I can't rid myself of it. I stayed there for one year. Now, you know, the play went long beyond that. We had commercials out, you know, don't, don't pick, eat, or whatever, with Anne de Savo played my wife. And I, I left. I left the play. I quit. You know why I quit? I didn't quit. I just said I wanted to go out. I felt that. I didn't want people to think I couldn't get another job because I hadn't worked that much in, in the field of acting. And I didn't want people to think I had one job and that's all I had. And also, I didn't want to be stereotypicalized as this Italian off, which you've seen, you know, throwing spaghetti around. However, I won an OB for that part uh, off Broadway, which I thought was phenomenal. I was surprised to get it. But I left it for that reason. I didn't stay the whole thing. I don't know who replaced me, but it was a wonderful comic opera. And Jessica James, I remember Jessica James, bunny, she climbed the pole and everything. My wife desperately wanted to meet her. She was such a, another person who passed away. God, oh man, so many, and she was so young. And, and my wife wanted to meet her. Sandy Cohen is a, She's just a girl who doesn't know anything about acting. She, don't, she doesn't particularly like actors, including me. But she wanted to meet Jessica, and then she, she got a taste of what acting could be like. She walks and knocks at the, I said, go over. She's right over in the dressing room. We're at the Little Theater, which is now the Helen Hayes Theater, incidentally. It was a the Little Theater then. My wife politely knocks at the door. Jessica opens the door, stone naked. Now you call it a door by accident, stone naked, or it was something on, you're a woman, you're doing something like this, you're holding, Jessa was like this. And Sandy, she's about five foot two, walks like a little duck. She's talking to Jessica, never once looking Jessica in the eye, constantly looking up. That was Jessica James, who I missed dearly. And Anne DeSalvo played my wife was sensational. And it was hard for her because I had to throw a bowl of spaghetti over her head every night. It was a wonderful experience. Any other questions? <laughs> Let's knock it out. Yeah. Hey, um, I know it didn't last very long, but you did that Della Ventura show I on love CBS. That show. I don't know what your thoughts were about I'm that. I'm going to tell you something. You may call it a failure. Other people may because we were off the air in 16 episodes. But you know how many people we drove? We actually drew a weekly 9 million people. Now, if nine million people were to be at your show now, it'll last for 10 years. However, there's so much competition now that the numbers are much smaller. And also, 80% of my audience, and don't ask me how this happened, I have no idea, were women. 80% of my audience were women. Now, I know that women look at me, they don't want to go to bed with me. They may want to sit down and have a glass of Coca-Cola with me and talk, you know, about Moonstruck, and that's about it. But I don't know why that is, and it, it, it still exists even today. My wife said, why? Why would women, you know, I, I said, I have no idea. Any women have any ideas? <laughs> why this may happen? I'm not a particularly good looking guy. I am 6'3", and I'm Italian. I'm a romantic. I'm a very nice guy, and I don't cheat. I gave myself away. Isn't that terrible? Yes, darling. If you need me, I'll be around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that line. I love it. And I miss the show terribly. And Les Moonves, who, I love Les Moonves. He's the greatest executive, executive 
who's ever been on television, in my opinion. And he asked me to do the. He was nurturing me for a long time. He gave me uh, the last Don, which I hated, and but I did it. And he paid me a tremendous amount of money to do it. And then he tried to sweetheart me into doing a series. And I was not interested in the series because I was hot in movies. I was cooking. I was on stage. I'm here. I had no idea what I was doing, but there I was. And I said, I don't want to do television. But he talked me into it. The truth in his eyes, when he spoke to me, and in his heart, he's truly a great man. And he talked me into something. You can't talk me into anything I don't want to do. He talked me into doing that series. And you know what he did? I said, but I can't go to California. I hate to fly. I, I, I want to stay. He gave me the show in New York. You know what it cost him? Two million, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars every eight days. So it cost him over thirty million dollars to keep me in New York. Who the hell am I? I was nobody. Who was I to say to him, I don't want to go to California. I want to be in New York. And he gave me it. I love him to this day. I went over to him one day, just recently, the Friars Club. He came to my table. I didn't know he was there. And he hugged, we hugged, and so forth. And, and I looked at him and I said, Les, I don't know if you realize it, but forgive me for using this number. It's not this. It just, it's. But you're responsible for giving me $4 million in two and a half years. I want to thank you for my house and my other house. <laughs> and he, he's a wonderful man. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to say I saw the movie Ford Apache, and I thought you were very really good. At I threw that kid off the roof, but you know that. Paul Newman and the very good cast. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I think you're a good actor. And Thank you. I'd, ex I'd accept something a little better than good because of really <laughs> good, good sits in the middle somewhere. I like to think, if you don't say great to me, I'm looking to commit suicide. <laughs> I love you for saying that, but I had to talk you into it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll get you right there. One final? Okay. Yes. How does it work with Spike? Great. Spike's a good friend of mine. And it's wonderful with Spike because we're on different levels of beliefs. You know, politically, forgive me for those who are liberal in the audience. I'm a conservative. And of course, he's a liberal. And there are so many other differences. He loves Michael Jordan. I love uh, Larry Bird for the obvious reasons. But, <laughs> but we, we talk all the time. And just recently, as a matter of fact, I did CBS in the morning. There was a wonderful show that they cut. It was a profile of me. And before, right after doing that, I went over to do Roseanne Scotto's show. It was a good day in New York or something. I'm not sure. We're doing the show, and they tell me that Spike was just there. I had no idea. And well, anyway, before I had gone up the shoot, Spike was downstairs. And he said, you're not gonna give me a book? I said, what are you, too cheap to buy a book? I said, Barnes and Noble, 26 bucks. What's the matter with you? But I went upstairs, and they were telling me all the things that Spike was saying about me, because we used to look at each other. We were at the Golden Globes, and then the Academy Awards, and I walked past him. He was sitting, I don't know who he was, I'm not quite sure. I think the producer, Johnny Killick. Yes, John Killick was there. I walk past, past Spike and I whisper in his ear as I'm going, remember, I'm the guy that brought you to the dance. <laughs> I said, before me, you did, you did you, she's got a habit. I said, what did that cost you, $14 an hour? I said, I put you on the map. This is how we talk all the time. Because after that, he wanted me to do a couple of other movies with, with him and I asked for a lot of money. And he said, but everyone's getting paid 150. I said, hey, I brought you to the dance. You ain't giving me 150. <laughs> Spike and I are very close. I love him. And here's how he came to the top of my totem pole. Yes, as a director. Yes, as a wonderful guy to work with. I lost my son, Danny Ayala III, who was a great stunt coordinator. I lost him in 2010, May 1st. And we were at the Campbell Funeral Home. And uh, a lot of people came to see my son. I mean, it was incredible how many people love him and all the stunt people and all the actors that came to see him. I felt somewhat like a second class citizen. Certainly they weren't there for me, they were there for my boy. Spike was in the back of the room. I didn't know he was there because I didn't know who was there because I didn't look anywhere but up at my son or in where he was lying. Spike, I was told, came down once, he stopped and went back. He came down twice, he stopped and he went back. Came down the third time, knelt down by me, I was sitting in the aisle in the front, and he says, Danny, do you mind if I say something? I said, no, of course not, go ahead. He got up and he did a eulogy for my son. And it had to do with, it started with do the right thing because 
three of us were in it. My son Danny was my stunt double. My son Rick was the cop that strangled or killed Radio Rahim and myself. So it was a tremendously moving moment in my life. And, and uh, And Spike, Spike was elevated uh, to a level that would be hard for any human being to achieve in my life, in my heart, and, and everything. But anyway, I thank you. And was that the last question? Thank you so much. For coming. I truly appreciate it.